I want to tell you today about our, you know, our work on this, you know, magic angle graphene and how it's turning into a new platform for, to study correlated physics and actually beyond, you know, both beyond graphene and beyond correlated physics, as I will <coughs> tell you a little bit later. But because it's, you know, the first time I, I, I come here to, to give this talk, let me start from a more generic point of view. Among, you know, among the most fascinating, you know, states of matter that we are aware of and that we you know, can think of are those where the interactions between particles are very strong. Okay? And this happens not just in condensed matter physics, it happens in all fields of physics pretty much. So you have, this occurs, for example, in the quark gluon plasma, which is a state of matter that happens a few nanoseconds, microseconds after the Big Bang, and that we can recreate now in collisions between heavy ions. This happens also at the different phases of nuclear matter in neutron stars. Okay? These are also very strongly correlated phases of neutrons. The, you know, the, the, this is taken from Wikipedia, and you can see that the different phases are called nuclear pasta. So they have the spaghetti phase, the lasagna phase, the bucatini phase. You know? the, the astrophysicists are much more creative than the condensed matter physicists are at naming things. You know, we have to learn a lot from them, I think. And then perhaps closer to, you know, to our hearts here is, um, you know, for example, the fractional quantum hole you know, faces matter where you know, due to interactions between electrons, you have very strange things happening, such as you know, fractional charges and, and interesting topological properties. Now, a number of, you know, a, a large fraction of the condensed matter community is working on what are known as strongly correlated quantum materials. And this is you know, very you know, vast, different classes of materials. For example, heavy fermions, where the interaction between electrons gives you gives rise to effective masses which can be hundreds or even thousands of times those of the bare electron mass. You also have materials such as quantum spin liquids where the electron spins, even as you cool down to zero temperature, they, they keep you know, fluctuating and they don't order, and they give rise to very interesting topological properties. And perhaps the most famous of, of all the you know, quantum materials are the family of high temperature you know, cupra superconductors where in a phase diagram of temperature versus doping, there are a variety of phases, few of which we have a good theoretical understanding, uh, about, you know, even to this day after many, many decades of work. So just to remind <clears throat> a little bit everyone, you know, what single particle you know, physics tell us about the electronic properties of materials. So from a single particle point of view, you basically have two behaviors. If you have a band, if you have a system which has insensitive states where you have one band here, band gap, and another band, and one of these bands is completely occupied. You put as many electrons as you can in this band. And then the other band is completely empty. Okay? This is an insulator, okay? because you, know, you have this band gap. And there's no, there are no available energy states at small energy where electrons can get promoted or excited via electric field or temperature to conduct electricity. So this is an insulator. If, on the other hand, you have a system, you know, again, same density of states, but now you put a number of electrons here such that one of these bands is partially occupied, okay? then in that case, you have free energy states at very small energies available for electrons to be excited via an electric field or temperature, and this thing can conduct. So from a single particle point of view, you, you know, pretty much have metals or insulators, and that's it. And it depends whether your Fermi level is you know, somewhere in a band or if a band is completely full and the next one is empty. Now, when you include the interaction between you know, electrons, the thing can change. Okay? So for example, you can be in a situation where your Fermi energy is here in the middle of a band, yeah? and therefore the system should be a metal. But due to strong interactions, a gap appears. This is not a single particle gap. This is a correlated gap. But you can see that this correlated gap is now splitting this band into two bands, one of them full, the other one empty. So you sort of go back to a situation similar to this, except that this is happening in a system where, you know, in single particle, you know, calculations it should be a metal, but this turns out to be a correlated insulator. Yeah? And one of the most ex uh, famous examples of correlated insulators are the uh, mod insulators. And that's partly uh, because they are believed to be the parent compound of the high temperature cuprate superconductors. Yeah? So in a cuprate superconductor, you have these copper oxygen planes. These in the copper atoms, you have one electron per copper atom, OK? So you have half filling of this system. The system, you know, have a band that is half filled. It should be a metal. But due to strong interactions between your electrons, it turns out to be an insulator. And now, an interesting thing happens as you remove a few of those electrons, OK? Now there's a, because you've removed a few of those electrons, now those electrons actually can move. The physics of this is believed to be described by 
the Hubbard model, okay, where there's an interesting game now as you have some missing electrons of, you know, these electrons now can jump from side to side because you have missing electrons. You're still pay, you know, paying a penalty of double occupancy of some of these sites. And as a result, the electrons have to move now in a correlated fashion, okay? And this gives rise, it is believed to give rise to this very interesting phase diagram. And I say it is believed and not that we know for sure because this Hopper model, you know, despite, you know, many, many years, cannot be solved theoretically yet exactly as, you know, many people here work on, on, on this. So we think that this connects to this, but we don't know for sure and we don't know exactly how it connects to all of these pieces. Now, the fact that it has taken, you know, it's, it's taken many decades and, and still, you know, theoretically, it's very hard to solve this problem, even in the simplest implementation, has led to people to try to very different approaches, you know, to study correlated physics. And one of them, one of, perhaps one of the most fascinating is that of using, you know, ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices to investigate strongly correlated <laughs> physics. So what you do here is you take lasers and you shine them at each other and you create a periodic potential for the atoms. And then you load these lattices with atoms. And this, you know, the, the, the atomic physicists have very refined control over the interaction strength in, of these atoms in this lattice. So that you can go, already in 2002, they demonstrated that you can go between a superfluid and a mode insulator by tuning the strength of interactions between these atoms. Now, this was done initially with, uh, with atoms which were bosons, okay, so integer spin. A few years later, they did this with fermionic atoms. So this was a realization of the fermi Haber model. This was the bose haber model. Yes, to give you an idea, the state of the art in this field is such that, you know, recently, a couple of years ago, so several groups were able to demonstrate short-range anti-ferromagnetism in this fermi Haber model. Okay? So they could see that, you know, if they load atoms in the lattice, they could see that they had, you know, anti-ferromagnetic order at least over a few lattice sites. So the ultra-cold atom people are starting to explore this corner sort of, of the phase diagram. They would like to go over the entire phase diagram, and in particular, they would like to see you know, this region of D-wave superfluidity due to repulsive interactions. But it is very, very hard to get down here in temperature. Okay? They are already working at a nanokelvin, or a fraction of a nanokelvin, and they have to go at an order of magnitude lower in temperature. And although there are no fundamental constraints on being able to do this. In, in principle, you know, no fundamental obstacles. In principle, it's, it's technically very hard, and they don't know if and when they will get there. So we have these you know, two platforms, you know, two examples of platforms to study correlated physics. One is quantum materials themselves. Okay? And the other one is cold atoms in optical lattices. And what I want to tell you about today is about magic angle graphene super lattices. And this is actually just one example. There are many, many more super lattices, so it's, it goes beyond graphene. Something that is interesting is that you know, in, in quantum materials, you have the typical lattice scale is a border of an angstrom, or a few angstroms. In cold atoms, it's about a micron. Magic angle graphene is sort of in between. It's two orders of magnitude from either you know, the typical super lattice length scale. Now, associated with these length scales are energy scales. Okay? So in Quantum materials, the typical energy scales at temperatures you're looking at are of the order of 100 or 1,000 Kelvin. In cold atoms, as I mentioned, it's of order of nanokelvin or hundreds of picokelvins. Magic angle graphene, because it's an intermediate between these two, the corresponding energy scales are also intermediate between the two, at about you know, 1 to 10 Kelvin, are typical energy scales. Quantum materials, we typically have relatively little control over the materials. Yeah. Cold atoms, they have perfect control over everything in their system. In magic angle graphene, as you will see, we have also intermediate degree of control between these two extremes. So it's a complementary platform to investigate correlated physics. So this is what I want to tell you about today. I want to tell you about 2D materials, you know, I'll introduce you know, Legoland, Twistronics, you know, various things that people talk about in this context. Then I'll tell you about graphene and what is magic angle graphene. And then I'll tell you about our observation of correlated insulative behavior and superconductivity. And then I hope to have some time at the end to tell you about uh, some of the latest developments in the field. So over the year, you know, we've been having a lot of fun over the past 15 years or so with 2D materials. The first one isolated was graphene, and then a whole bunch of others came. And it was great to study each of these materials individually, let's say graphene, for example. But then people quickly realized that because you can isolate from 3D, you know, bulk layer materials, 
one monolayer out of many of these, we could also just assemble them back together. Yeah? So this led to many reviews, where my, you know, my friends and colleagues here wrote reviews, you know, making analogies with, with Legoland, where each Lego piece is like a one you know, 2D material. Now, the analogy with Legoland is a very good one. You know, there are not that many systems where you can play this game of putting anything that you want on top of anything that you want. But perhaps it's not the most unique aspect of 2D materials. Because you know? after all, when you think about Lego, you know, so you know, I have small kids, so I play Lego all the time with them. And you know, often my, my, you know, my son or my daughter, they come and they tell me, Daddy, I cannot stack this piece of Lego on top of the other, right? And then I have to tell them, oh, you have to rotate it because it has to be perfectly aligned in order to stack one Lego piece on top of the other, OK? So this is something that happens also when you grow by MB, you know, semiconductor heterostructures or metallic super lattices. They typically grow aligned. Yeah? You have many more constraints there because of chemical in, you know, compatibility, lattice compatibility, etc. So it's true that 2D materials give you a lot more freedom, but still, if you if you focus on Legoland, it means everything has to be aligned. Okay? And that's nice, but not the most unique aspect of 2D materials. I think the most unique aspect of 2D materials is actually that you can do this. Yeah. You can put a 2D material on top of itself or on top of another 2D material, and you can do this with any angle of rotation that you want between the two layers. Yeah. This angle can be 30 degrees, 50 degrees, 27 degrees, 1.1 degrees, as I will show today, and completely at will. This is something that is you know, unprecedented in the history of material science. You could not do this before to the material scale. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that the electronic, optical, mechanical properties of these systems can change dramatically as a function of this twist angle, okay? as I will show you today. So let me stop this before you get sick. So now, let me tell you a little bit about um, graphene and what is actually magic angle graphene. I assume most of you have actually heard about graphene. So graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. All of these atoms are identical chemically, carbon, but crystallographically they are inequivalent. You know, we say that graphene is a hexagonal lattice with a two atom basis. You know, we call it the A and B atoms. Okay? They're all carbon but crystallographically inequivalent. Now you can calculate the electronic structure of graphene using a simple you know, model. And it gives this very unusual electronic structure where near the Fermi energy you have this massless, you know, linear energy momentum dispersion, you know, which, which has led to all kinds of analogies with ultra relativistic particles. In fact, when you, you know, write down the Hamiltonian for the dispersion, it happens to be like this. This is nothing else than the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles. So energy is linear in momentum, and there is here a, a spinner, which in the Dirac equation, the spinner tells you about spin up and down of the electrons, but in Graphene, it tells you whether the electron wave function is a pseudo spin that tells you whether the electron wave function is on the A or B sublattice. Now, the other thing which is important is that we have two of these valleys. These are called the Dirac cones or valleys, K and K prime valleys. So, electrons in graphene have this fourfold degeneracy spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime. Okay? Four will appear later, so it's good to remember. Number four. Now, what happens if you put graphene on top of graphene? You know, as I showed a moment earlier, a moiré pattern forms, okay? And the moiré wavelength, the separation between these soccer balls that you see here, okay, depends on the twist angle, okay? And it can go all the way to infinity because these two lattices are identical. Now, this is what happens in real space. Let's look at what happens in momentum space and correspondingly to the electronic structure, okay? So this is a single sheet of graphene. This is the electronic structure. This is the Dirac cones. If I put my Fermi energy at some finite value, I have these Fermi disks in momentum space. This is the below zone. Okay? The Fermi disks are at the K and K prime points. Now let's put another sheet of graphene on top. If they are perfectly aligned on top of each other, then the reciprocal spaces are also right on top of each other. Okay? If we now rotate, if we rotate in real space, the reciprocal spaces also rotate. And this leads to separation of the Dirac cones of layer one and layer two of graphene in momentum space. Okay? And the separation in momentum space is given by this formula. It's proportional to the sine of half the angle of rotation. So now, this twisting leads to layer Dirac cones which separate the momentum space. Now, let's start from a small but finite angle, twist angle, and let's go towards smaller and smaller angles and let's see what happens okay, to the electronic structure. So we're going to start from a small angle, so the sine of the angle will be the angle. Okay? 
this is what you get, okay, for the Dirac cones of you know layer one of graphene and layer two of graphene. The separation in momentum space between the two Dirac cones, the two Dirac points, is given by this, okay, because this is a small angle. Now, this would be the situation if the two, if the electrons in the two graphene sheet, in the electrons in the graphene sheets did not know that the other graphene sheet exists. Okay? But these three sheets, these two sheets, remember, are just three angstroms apart, so they are very much <coughs> on top of each other. So the electrons are very much aware that the other graphene sheet exists, and they can tunnel between the sheets. This means that this crossing point between the dispersion of the Dirac points, in reality, opens a band gap there to do interlayer tunneling. Okay, so this interlayer tunneling W opens a gap to W there, and this is the situation that occurs when this band gap that opens here okay, is much less than the energy at which that crossing point occurs. Okay? And this band gap that opens there is just the same thing as bonding and debonding you know, energy states in a hydrogen molecule. The same thing here, but for two graphene sheets. Now, what happens if we rotate now towards smaller and smaller angles? So as we rotate towards smaller and smaller angles, the Dirac cones come closer, closer, and closer to each other. But remember, they're on top of each other if the angle is zero. So they come closer and closer, and you can see that this crossing point where there is bond repulsion, okay, level repulsion, this one becomes flatter. As we get the icons come closer, they will become flatter and flatter and flatter. So as we decrease the twist angle, there is an angle for which this band becomes flat. Okay? When 2W is of order that, this band reaches zero, okay, the lower band, it becomes flat. So this flat band condition is reached at an angle which was coined by Bistus and McDonald, the magic angle. Okay? So this angle is about 1.1 degrees. Okay? And I have to mention that there was also earlier theoretical work that had also calculated this angle. They got a 1.5 degrees, you know, a bit off, but they were already talking about flat bands. And there was also experimental indications from the group of Ivan Dre, who did the scanning tunnel microscopy studies of twisted bilayer graphene. They saw that you know, there is a von Hoff singularity in the density of states, a peak that shows up in the STM spectra when you put your energy there. And they saw that those peaks were going towards zero, and they extrapolated and they said, you know, this will be zero at 1.16 degrees. Okay? So there was already good, you know, inter you know, theoretical work and spreading the work suggesting that this 1.1 degrees should be something special. So this is sort of a cartoon. Let me show you an actual calculation of the electronic structure as we twist, you know, the, the, as we change the twist angle. So again, these are the reciprocal. You know, these are the brillouin zones of the two graphene sheets which are on top of each other. Okay? If you join the corner of this reciprocal of these brillouin zones, you get the super lattice brillouin zone. You can see the super lattice brillouin zone is small. You have a large wavelength more pattern in real space, which means you have a small super lattice in momentum space. Okay? Here I'm gonna show a video. In this video, you have energy versus momentum. This starts with a rotation angle of three degrees. Within this energy window, this is for twisted by layer graphene, but within this energy window, this just looks like graphene. Okay? Six Dirac cones, only two of them are in equivalent, you know, coming out of the K points. Okay? As I now rotate the twist angle towards smaller and smaller angles, you're going to see several things. The first thing is that this super lattice real one zone is going to become smaller. Again, as I go towards smaller angle, longer in real space, which means smaller in reciprocal space. So it's going to rotate, become smaller, and you're going to see a reconstruction of these energy bands. So let me run this movie. So you see the angle is rotating. Now at some point we get this set of flatter bands separated by gaps from the next bands. At about 1.1 it's going to become very flat. Okay? Now it continues evolving in a complex fashion. Yeah? Let me run this again so you can appreciate it. My students work a lot on this. So. Yeah. This set of bands, which now has become isolated from their more remote bands, becomes very flat there at 1.1, and then it continues evolving in a complex manner. Yeah? So if you include lattice relaxation in the x, y, and z directions, it seems that this angle for which the bands become flattest is closer to about 1.05 degrees, although you know, the last digit in this angle continues to fluctuate depending on the models, parameters, etc. So. Now, let me show you a cut through that flat pancake. So the bands are flat, but not perfectly flat. Okay? They're just much, much flatter than the graphene bands, orders of magnitude flatter. 
this bands which are flat in momentum space, okay, so flat in momentum space means highly localized in real space. Let's just do the Fourier transform of, of this. Which means that if you look at when the, you know, when the, for the electrons that are in these flat bands, where do they like to sit, okay? Turns out they like to sit in spots where the local stacking between the two graphene sheets is AA. So where locally, it looks like all of the carbon atoms are on top of, uh, in one layer, are on top of the carbon atoms in the bottom layer. And these regions of AA stackings where electrons like to sit, they're separated from regions of AB and BA stacking, which is a natural stacking in graphite, okay? So these regions of high electron you know, concentration are tunnel coupled through AB and BA stacking. That's what gives the bands a little bit of curvature, okay, that tunneling. So schematically, if you look from the top, you have these AA spots, okay, which form a hexagonal lattice where the charge likes to be separated by AB and BA stacking. Or, you know, in a slightly more realistic picture, you have this AA spots, you know, yellow means electrons like to be there. The separation between these spots, AA spots is 13.4 nanometers. This is what's going to be a triangular, in quotes, fermi Haber lattice for us. And triangular in quotes because in reality, this is, you know, the AB and BA regions are not identical. So this is actually a honeycomb lattice in reality. And people took a little bit of, you know. So it's triangular but with a two atom, you know, with a two plaquette basis. So. Can I ask you a question? Yep. <clears throat> so the flatness of the band is not just basically in the chemistry, chemical language and then non-bonding, but probably due to some interference effects that kills mm -hmm. effectively kills the hopping, right? Yes. So non-trivially flat. It's non-trivially flat. Yeah. And in fact, to this day, I was, I was talking about this with some of, some of you earlier, to this day, we do not exactly understand what's the most essential, the key ingredient to get these bands that flat, okay? This is still subject of theoretical debate. What is the key ingredient to get these bands flat? You know, people get it out of the calculations, but it's not 100% understood at a deep level, you know, why these bands are flat and so robust. So let me tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, our data, but before I show you data, let me show you how we fabricate these devices. Okay? So we start with a glass slide, which is a polymer stack on it, a transparent polymer stack in it. And then we bring a substrate, which has a material which is called hexagonal boronitride. Hexagonal boronitride is a layered material, is an insulator, it happens to be a very nice substrate for graphene devices. So for the purpose of this first part of the talk, we just use it as a very nice substrate for graphene. It's ultra flat. This is maybe 10, 20 nanometer thick, something like this. So we come with the polymer, which is sticky, and we pick up this hexagonal boronitride. Then we bring another substrate, which has a monolayer sheet of graphene on it. Okay? This is standard, you know, thousands of groups around the world can do this. And now the tricky thing, which is a little bit special, is that we position our top you know, polymer and HVN such that it is halfway on top of the graphene, okay? Then we come down with it and we tear half of the graphene. Now, from the top, this looks like this. We have our substrate with half of the graphene and we have the glass slide with the hexagonal water nitride and the other half of the graphene. These are offset in the Z direction. But because these two pieces come from the same piece of graphene, they are crystallographically aligned, one with respect to the other, okay? So now I can rotate my substrate or my glass slide by any angle that I want, for example, 1.05 degrees, why not, okay? And then I can shift them and stack them on top of each other, okay? So now I create this heterostructure Okay, of these two rotated sheets, and amazingly, it happens. You create this morning pattern, okay? In fact, you pick it up, and now you can continue putting this on top of another hexagonal or nitride layer and do nanofabrication and make a device. So after, you know, all this fabrication, which is standard, except this pickup tear and pickup thing, which is a bit non-standard, okay, and that only a few groups know how to do this. The rest is very standard. We put source and drain contacts. We have our twisted valet graphene encapsulated in hexagonal laboratory sheets. We also have one or two metallic planes, which we use as you know, plates of a parallel plate capacitor with the twisted valet graphene, so that by applying a gate voltage, by applying a voltage between this metal plane and the twisted valet graphene, we can accumulate charge in the graphene. Okay, so we make a parallel plate capacitor. <coughs> So let me, you know, 
Let me remind you how conduction through graphene looks like. Okay, if you measure the conductivity of graphene as a function of density or Fermi energy, okay, if you have your Fermi energy deep in the valence band, you have lots of holes, so you conduct very well. If you have your Fermi energy deep in the conduction band, you have lots of electrons, so you conduct very well. If you have your Fermi energy at the charge neutrality point or the direct point, you have very few charge carriers, so you conduct poorly. So the conductivity of graphene versus density looks like this shape. Okay? And this has been seen by thousands of groups around the world. Let me show you how it looks for twisted bilayer graphene. Okay? So let's start first with a device which has a rotation angle which is larger than, than a couple of degrees. Okay? So if we plot conductivity versus density, and now I'm normalizing density by NS. NS is the density that corresponds to four electrons per moiré unit cell. Remember that four would appear, spin up, spin down, bali, k, k prime, okay? So if I normalize by, you know, four electrons per moiré unit cell, which is how many electrons you need to fill that, you know, from charge neutrality, that flat band, okay? You get this. I'll show real density values in a moment, okay? This is just schematically to compare samples. So you see, conductivity versus density, these are actual data for a device which has a rotation angle more than three degrees. This just looks V-shaped because this just looks like graphene. So even though it's twisted by graphene, this looks pretty much the same. Yeah? Now let's choose a twist angle which is you know, small but not yet magic, okay? something like 1.8 degrees. If we have 1.8 degrees, now within this energy window, the electronic structure has already been changed so, you know, substantially. Okay? You have these bands which have lower Fermi velocity and that are separated by band gaps from the other remote bands. Okay? So near charge neutrality, near zero, you still have V-shape because this looks just like graphene, near charge neutrality. But as you increase your Fermi level you know, to the top of the band, you reach this band gap, so your conductivity goes to zero when you completely fill this band with four electrons per more unit cell. If you completely empty this band, you go again to zero conductivity because you reach this band gap okay? before you conduct more as you populate the remote bands. Okay? So this insulated behavior at full filling or fully emptying of these flat bands is a behavior which you know, we, we reported a few years ago. It was has been reproduced by several groups. It's, it's quite well understood in principle as a single particle effect, even though their interactions affect these things. But you know, origin is single particle. Now let me show you what happens when you measure a magic angle device. Okay? So this is data for a device with a 1.08 degrees. Okay? So again, near charge neutrality, this still looks Dirac-like. So you have a V-shaped conductivity. Insulated behavior when you completely fill or when you completely empty your bands because you have these large gaps now. But notice that as we put half as many electrons in your conduction band or half as many holes in your conduction band as needed to fully you know, fill these bands, you get also insulated states. The system should be a metal, but you get an insulated state there, okay? So these are actual real data with real units. I mean, the, the other one also data, but these are the real units, okay? Conductance. How do you know, how do you define the n-axis experimentally? Mm -hmm. So we know that. You know where one is. We know where one is, so we know where one half is. Okay? Because we know that there's this insulated behavior. But, but you know that the density is linear in gate voltage or something? Yes. So just fixing the endpoints is enough? Yes. Okay. We, mes we, you know, we do whole measurements, we do half the butterfly measurements, and we do lambda fan diagram measurements, and all agree with each other. So we know what's the area of the Mori unit itself. And just to clarify terminology and electron counting, <laughs> so, which is always a. So, uh, charge neutrality here is, is zero. I call that zero. I will, am I going to be calling it? And so when we're no, talking for this about half-filling. So half-filling, this, this comes from you know, my, my heritage as a graphene person. Yes, you know. exactly. So zero, I call charge neutrality. And then from there to the top of the band, half-filling, I meant half-filling of the conduction band or half-emptying of the balance band. Okay? Now, charge neutrality can be gapped or not. Okay, depending on which devices you look at, if it is gapped, then it's actually half filling of that isolated upper conduction band or that isolated valence band. But if not, it's true that half filling, you would understand zero. And in that sense, I mean a quarter filling or three quarters filling. But, but again, just to do the, the counting, because you have two atoms per unit cell, mm -hmm. if I just think yeah. 
And in, I have in, two spin directions yeah. and two valleys. This flat top. band contains eight electrons right, so eight per more unit cell. Altogether. So zero is four in that eight Zero is four, but it's just neutral, so you call it zero. Yeah. yeah. OK, and how can yeah. two? In, yeah, this okay. is two we'll electrons see. per more unit cell. This is yeah. two holes per more unit cell. Okay. okay? <clears throat> yeah. So now, this is the conductance versus density, okay, with real units, okay? Remember, this is charge neutrality. I'm put, adding electrons in this direction. I'm adding holes in this direction. This is four electrons per more unit cell. This is four holes per more unit cell. You see two holes, two electrons per more unit cell. You see a dip here at one. I'll show later. Stuff happens at one and at three electrons or holes per more unit cell. Okay, so uh, the, the situation overall is a lot more complex than I'm describing right now. This um, showing some simplified simplifications. So when we look at these insulated states, we realize very quickly that they were highly unusual. And the first, the first thing that we realize is that these insulated states only happen in a very narrow angular range around this 1.1 degree. Okay? <laughs> Basically, we see these insulated states between about 1 and 1.2 degrees, more or less. Okay? The second thing that. Wait, uh, we yep. will come back later as to what happens at 1 and 1 X. I'll mention, so I'll, I'll mention a couple of things about 1 and 3. There's a gap there, right? Uh, where? Oh, no, this is the single particle gap for four electrons and four holes per molar unit cell. Oh, four, okay. Yes, those are the big band gaps. That's, this is the these are, these okay, are these okay. big single particle band gaps. Okay, okay. the labels are 2 and 4. This no. These are this is density in units. No, these are density in units of 10 to the 12 per centimeter square. So it has nothing to do with the Fini no, no, factor. No, yes, Just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, when we look at these insulated states, the thing that was most striking is that in a magnetic field they become metallic states, and that's very unusual. Okay, so if you look at this and you apply a magnetic field. And it doesn't matter if the magnetic field is perpendicular or parallel to the two graphene sheets, which means it's a Seaman effect. Okay? The system goes from you know, dark means insulator to red, which means metallic. Okay? <coughs> now, this is highly unusual because you know, electrons are charged particles in a magnetic field, in a perpendicular magnetic field in particular, they like to go in circles, so they like to localize. So most systems, you know, if you start with a metal and you apply a magnetic field, it, it tends towards becoming an insulator. If you start with an insulator, it becomes a stronger insulator. You never have that you have a system of two-dimensional electrons, you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, you start with an insulator, and it goes to a metal. That's highly unusual, OK? That, that, you know, it's very rare, and it happens. But it happens here, OK? So now, to cut a you know, long story short, because I want to show you, you know, the, the superconductivity uh, results, the, the picture, the soft picture that we came up with is the following. In a single particle, you know, from a single particle point of view, we have this set of flat bands with, with you know, a charge neutrality point here in the density state. So you know, these are two bands which are with a zero gap between them, in principle, if they are, you know, if they are direct touching there, which again, this is, you know, I'll comment about this later. In a many body picture, when you put your Fermi energy here, halfway here or here, okay, a correlated gap opens. Now these two systems are made out of singlets. Yeah? So when you apply now a magnetic field, in particular a Zeeman field, the singlets get polarized, and they close the gap, and the system becomes a metal and starts conducting. Okay? Now, in our paper, we, were, we tried to be careful. We, mo we call this a mod-like, in quotes, you know, insulator, in the sense that this thing occurred when we put our Fermi energy halfway here or here. Okay? Other people have shown now, actually, that a different Moire system ABC trilayer graphene aligned to hexagonal boron nitride also has exhibits a similar behavior, and they were you know more more straight you know they call it mod insulator. Okay, the actual nature of this insulated state is still very much under the theoretical debate. Okay, and experimentally also we don't know for sure. Okay, what it's you know it's clear that interactions play a role, but exactly what type of correlative insulator we have is not clear. Now. Um, this, this, you know, this work here appeared a little bit, I mean, it's, it's in 2019, but it was posted in the archive just a, a month or so after our publication. It's very interesting work. Now, let me show you about superconductivity. So when we were doing these experiments, this is the same data as before, yeah? we were measuring conductors with density, and we were doing temperature dependence, and then we, you know, we, we saw here around, let me remind you, this is electrons, this is holes, this is two electrons per more unit cell, 
this we call the correlated insulated state for electrons. This is the correlated insulated state for holes. So if we look at, you know, around the correlated insulated state for electrons, we do temperature dependence. We didn't see in these initial devices much happening. You know, this behaves like an insulator. If you cool down, the conductance becomes smaller. That's what an insulator does. However, around the correlated insulated state for holes, we saw that the, for the insulator itself, okay, the one that occurs at two holes per mole unit cell, indeed, also the same thing, it's an insulator. You cool down and become more insulated. But right next to it, it was this region where the conductance increased very fast as we cool down in temperature. Right? Now, these devices, initially, they were two terminal devices, or they were devices measured in a two terminal geometry. What does it mean? It means we have a you know, metallic contact, the twisted valley graphene, and another metallic contact. And you measure this device, and you're always measuring in series the resistance of your metallic leads. Initially, we were looking for insulator states in this system. And this is a good geometry to measure an insulator, because if you expect your resistance to become infinite, infinite plus some series resistance, still infinite, so it's good. But if you want to measure determine if something conducts very well, you want to change geometry and do what is known as a four-terminal geometry measurement. So when we saw this conductance enhancement, my students showed me the data, and I was like, hmm, you know, let's, let's check out how, how well that thing that wants to conduct, you know. So in fact, I remember the student asking me, should we make four-terminal devices? And I said, what are you talking about? Of course we're going to make four-terminal devices. Let's see what that thing wants to be, OK? So we fabricated devices, you know, same fabrication as before, except that now we have whole bars with you know, six terminals in this case, so that we can run a current and measure the voltage drop within the device without any serious resistance. Initially, we characterized the devices into two terminal geometry. So this is, again, conductance to terminal versus density, same as before, but with a small perpendicular magnetic field. This is for a device with 1.16 degrees device, a twist angle. You see here this shape. Yeah, charge neutrality, you have four electrons and four holes. Look at the labels up here. Four electrons and four holes per mole unit cell. You have you know, deep scaling conductance at two and minus two. You see you have also stuff happening at three and minus three. Okay, this is another example where stuff happens at other integer. Now, this is with a small perpendicular magnetic field. If we now measure this device again at zero magnetic field, you see that around the correlated insulated states for electrons, not too much happened in this device. But uh, around the correlated insulator state for holes, a lot of happens. A lot happens. Okay, so now we switch from two terminal to four terminal geometry, and we measure the resistance. And the resistance the temperature shows us twist, magic angle twisted valley graphene superconducts. Okay, the resistance goes down by several orders of magnitude below our noise measurement floor. This is data for two devices: 1.16 degrees, 1.05 degrees. We have many more devices now. I'll show you later. Okay. And you, know, you can do any test that you want of two-dimensional superconductivity. These are, for example, VI curves, you know, which show nice switching current behavior. You can analyze this in terms of you know, cost of lethality transition. Anything that you want to look at, you know, this is, it, it checks. This is a two-dimensional superconductor. And in particular, the nice thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, we have this gate voltage control over the density in our devices. So we can do this. Okay? We can measure the resistance. We can park around the correlated insulated state for holes, measure the resistance as a function of temperature and density. Okay? Here we have the correlated insulated state. This occurs at two holes per mole unit cell. We add a few more holes, and we have a superconducting dome. We add a few electrons with respect to this correlated insulated state for holes, and we have another superconducting dome. So now the moment I saw this, you know, it reminded me of the hundreds of times that I've seen pictures like this at many talks at MIT and elsewhere. Okay? Now, uh, this is the phase diagram of you know, high temperature Cooper superconductors. For some reason, they get the doping axis wrong. Let me just flip them for you. Okay, now it's correct. So at zero concentration, this is a half filled you know, mode insulator, antiferromagnetic mode insulator state. If you go in this direction and you do electron doping, you have a small superconducting dome. If you go hole doping, you have a larger superconducting dome. In our case, we have a correlated insulator state, half filling of this conduction band or this. Balance band. If you add electrons, you have superconducting dome. If you add holes, you have another superconducting dome. Okay. Except, you know, the difference between this and this is that it, this is a theoretical phase diagram. Okay? In order to populate this with points, you actually have to grow for each point in this x you know, in this concentration axis. You have to grow a different crystal with different chemical impurities 
often different material classes for electrons and for holes, and different material classes in different doping ranges. Okay? We can go from here to here in the same cooldown with the same disorder realization in a few seconds using an electrical knob. Okay? So that's something that is very powerful. So I have to say that this is you know, one of the most symmetric cases that we have seen. Okay? The majority of the cases, it looks like this, a big dome for uh, holes, okay? This one in particular, TC, is much larger than for this. You know, for here, TC was about you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 Kelvin. Here is 1.7 Kelvin for holes. It's you know, a fraction of a Kelvin for electrons, and it's much more a dome for electrons. Now, this is a two-dimensional superconductor, so you can apply magnetic field and kill it. You can look at the resistance versus temperature in different magnetic fields. You can apply perpendicular magnetic fields or in-plane magnetic fields, because this is a two-dimensional superconductor. It can withstand very large in-plane magnetic fields and still be a superconductor, okay? Because there's very little orbital effect in the in-plane direction. In fact, you can do all of this continuously as a function of density, similar to before. Okay, so these are data for the, the, these two devices that I mentioned before, resistance versus density, but now instead of temperature, you have perpendicular magnetic field, okay? So you have also these two domes. Now, when my students brought me these data, I was like, hmm, you know, this is okay, but it looks a little bit ugly, you know. What's all this crap, you know, all that noise, you know. It doesn't look as good as the other domes. But then we noticed that this is not noise, it's certainly not crap. It actually is periodic, okay? What happens is that if you put your Fermi energy between the superconductor and the insulator state, the system doesn't know what to do. Should it go superconducting or should it go insulator? So what it does is it does both, okay? This so segregates into superconducting and insulating islands, and if you tune the density appropriately, eventually you come up with a superconducting system where two islands which are insulated remain, which give rise to a squid a superconducting quantum interference uh, device geometry. So if you look now, you park your chemical cup potential there, and you look at you know, do the differential resistance as a function of current bias, so you're measuring critical current, as a function of perpendicular field, you have these Fraunhofer-like patterns, okay? In reality, the pattern depends on, you know, we mostly can model it using a, you know, two junctions, whether they're symmetric or asymmetric, okay? But this is very nice, because this shows, actually, that there is just an effect in the system, okay, which shows phase coherence, okay? Which then just unambiguously demonstrated if there was any doubt before that this is a 2D superconductor. Now, how strong a superconductor is magic angle graphene? You've seen already the, you know, the critical temperatures of order in those early devices up to 1.7 Kelvin. Now we have devices where it's larger, about three Kelvin, three point something is our record. So, you know, compared to the cuprates, it's a very small temperature, critical temperature, okay? However, people don't typically compare how strong are superconductors based on the absolute value of the critical temperature. You know, that's good for many things, including you know, applications, of course. But typically, what you do is you compare how high is TC compared to how many electrons are there in the system you know, available to give you, to contribute to the superconductivity. And this is something that is typically shown in, a, in something that is known as a Uemura plot by Tomoe Uemura, who is at Columbia. So this is one version of this, of this Uemura plot from, taken directly from his paper here. So you have in a log log, plot TC versus Fermi temperature or, or you know, density appropriately normalized to, you know, to, to, to compare 3D and 2D materials, etc. So in this diagram, most conventional superconductors are towards this corner. For example, you have here aluminum. Aluminum has a TC also of 1 Kelvin, very similar to magic angle graphene. It has a Fermi temperature of over 100,000 Kelvin. Okay? So aluminum has a gigantic amount of electrons, and given the so many electrons that it has, it superconducts relatively modestly. As you go diagonally in this direction, okay, northwest, you get more and more exotic superconductors. In particular, in this purple band, you have pretty much all of the unconventional superconductors. Okay? You have here the cuprates up here, you have the nictites here, you have some organics, you have the heavy fermions, I'm including here some data points from cold atoms, okay? Both axes multiply by 100 million so that they appear in this plot, but in terms of coupling strength, they're the strongest couple systems that we can have, okay? So where is magic angle graphene in this diagram? Yeah? Um, what does EDLT stand for? 
uh, EDLT. This is a you know zirconium nitrogen chloride electron double layer transistor. I think it's one of the ionic. It's, it's one of the ionic gated you know materials. Yeah. So where is magic angle graphene here? It's there. It's among the strongest coupled superconductors that we're aware of. Okay. So, but, but wait, wait. To, to, to place the material on this plot, yep. you need to know what M star is. Yes, we measured it. How, how do you determine what you... From temperature dependence of the Schumacher cross oscillations. Okay, so, so M star is defined from Schumacher to Haas, essentially, at yep. that carrier concentration. Yep. And M naught is... Uh, M naught is the electron mass, the bare electron mass, and M star is the effective mass. So this is M star over M naught is the effective mass. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Again, this thing is taken directly from Thomas' paper, all the data points. We just do the same thing everybody else does and put a data point there. Okay? You can argue whether that's the best, but it's a fair comparison because it's the way all of these data points were extracted. So the only and, other... And, and just to elaborate further on sure. that, so the bottom axis, which is TF... Yeah, this is just is... a conversion from this to this directly. That's really density. Yeah, I understand, but yeah. that, that's my question. This is density. This is not an effective Fermi scale where coherence appears. No, no. It's, it's density. It means yeah, you, know, you assume, you ass, you know, T, you know, TF, you know, is, 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 you know, square root of, you know, density, and, okay, in, in two dimensions, okay? And in three dimensions is two thirds of, it's directly this, this thing is directly this formula of this formula, okay? Also you. So there's only one other system, monolayer iron selenide on STO, which is also an ultra strong coupled system. Although I hear there's a lot of debate about where the Fermi temperature is in this system. There's a multiband system, etc. So now, yeah, you know, many many questions remain. Okay, we, you know, we, the people always ask me what is the origin of the correlated insulator state and what is the superconducting or the parameter. And in case you haven't been paying attention to the archive, you know, I, I, I stopped updating this list when the font became too small, which happened only a few weeks after we posted the paper, you know. Very funny, it takes us. So the first paper was by Senke Shu and Dion Valens, okay, that, that they predicted this D plus ID chiral topological superconductor. They posted two weeks after we published our paper, so it takes two years to do experiment, takes two, years, two weeks to do the theory, you know. But as you can see, there's no agreement between all of these things. I don't want to talk too much about, you know, there's pretty much all letters of the alphabet have been proposed for the other parameter, you know. S, P, D, F, combinations of all of them with I's or without I's in between. So, you know, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't want to, you know, tell too much because I, you know, I don't know enough. I only want to point out this second paper, okay? This was posted, I think, a couple of days after Senke Susan Leon Balance. So this paper was by Bolovic, a very Gregory Bolovic, uh, Distinguished conditional theorist working in Finland. Um, he posted a very short paper. He sent us an email before and said, in the email he said, Pablo, finally, someone has realized everything that I predicted theoretically. So, you know, this is funny, but actually we get lots of emails from theorists like that. So it's not, you know, that's not the strange thing. The strange thing is that what he posted in this paper is something that for, you know, for, for years, for actually for decades, going back to the 50s, to the 1950s, about one or two experimental reports per decade have shown evidence you know, with different degrees of, of you know, evidence of extremely high temperature superconductivity in graphite, yeah? including room temperature superconductivity in graphite. So Gregory Volovic in 2013 or 14, I forgot, but well before our discovery, he wrote a paper where he said, look, these are too many reports for too many decades to ignore. What all of these works have in common is that they've been doing experiments on turbostratic graphite. Graphite where there are small misalignments, angular misalignments between the graphene lattices. If you have those small angular misalignments, you are gonna have flat bands in the system which is gonna give you strongly coupled superconductivity with very high TC, okay? So he posted that paper a number of years ago. And, and the reason why all of the experiments are relatively unreproducible is because, you know, the, these crystals of graphite never reproducible. Who knows exactly how the planes are twisted, etc. So then in this paper, he said, finally, someone has done a well-controlled experiment, just two planes, slightly rotated. You see flat bands. You see strongly coupled superconductivity. And then he told us, Paolo, 
just stack a few more and get to room temperature. Come on, just get to work, you know. <laughs> so he provided us motivation, you know. I used to think that those reports in graphite were it's, it's crazy. Now I'm like, I don't know, you know, who knows? You know, maybe, maybe some of those reports are actually true, yeah? The first one was room temperature superconductivity, beautiful Fraunhofer pattern. If it's not, if you believe the data, there's not much else that could cause those data. I don't, I'm, I'm not aware, it's interesting. Anyway, so let me in the last you know, 10 minutes tell you a little bit about what has happened since we announced this last year. So we announced this in the March meeting last year, you know, and a lot of people were interested. What has happened since? But the first thing that has happened is that we have reproduced our own results, okay? Now, that doesn't always happen, so it's good when it happens, you know? <laughs> and believe it or not, it doesn't always happen, so it's good to do it. We have a lot more devices. In fact, we're starting to sort of map out a dome, but not a superconducting dome as a function of doping, but a superconducting dome as a function of twist angle. So this is TC at optimal doping for the strongest superconducting dome, which is the one around two holes plus extra holes, okay? Per more unit cell. So this is TC, you can see the largest values are about three, three point something now. The error bars are, you know, the, the data points are 50% nomastite resistance, okay? These transitions are a bit broad because we're in two dimensions. So the error bars indicate from 10% to 90%, okay? And I have included also a data point from another group that reported, one of the other groups that have reproduced our results where they said what they are, you know, 50% uh, resistance was. So you see, there's a dome. This thing is superconducting in between about 0.95 and 1.2 degrees, okay? We can find superconductivity, and, and we'll keep populating this plot. We have actually a few more data points now that I haven't included. This is a little bit out of date. Much better than you reproducing yourself is that other people reproduce your data. So other groups have completely reproduced our results, okay, independently, and extended those results in very interesting directions. So the first one to reproduce our results was a collaboration between Andrea Yang and Cory Dean at Columbia University. So first thing that they did is they made a magic angle graphene device and they measured it and they showed correlated insulated states and superconductivity. So they reproduced our results. Then they did something very interesting, which is, remember I told you that this flat band condition depends on what is the interlayer tunneling between the two sheets. So what they did is they got a device which had an angle which was larger than 1.1 degree, 1.27 degree, as you can see here. They measured it and they saw no correlated insulated states, no superconductivity. Then they applied pressure between the graphene sheets, okay, such that they could tune the pressure such that they could reach flat band condition for that angle. They measured and they saw correlated insulated states and superconductivity. Then they applied larger pressure and they saw that the superconductivity and the, and the correlations weakened substantially. And they knew how much pressure exactly they had to apply because a little bit earlier, my collaborators at Harvard, and you know, I'm also involved, but it was mostly their work, we had determined what is the interlayer coupling dependence of the flat band condition. So we, can, we literally computed what pressure do you need to apply for a given angle such that your band becomes flat. You can see at different angles, the bands are less flat, but if you apply pressure, enough pressure, you get flat band condition. So this was, a, you know, this experiment from Columbia was, a, you know, I'm very happy, it was a beautiful experiment, you know, confirming our results and extending them, showing unambiguously that is, all this behavior is related to this flat band condition. Now, more recently, the group of Dmitry Efetov has shown that you don't get only this superconducting dome, which is the largest, the one at two holes. We had seen also this one and, and this one and another one here, which he doesn't see it, but he sees other domes in other, you know, near other filling factors, okay? So by now, there's suspicion that if we make, at least for some twist angles, if you make the devices clean enough, you will have superconducting domes pretty much next to every correlated insulated state. By the way, we see correlated insulated state at each integer, okay? Or correlated semi-metal states at each integer. Mm -hmm. By now, several groups have seen we too. Yeah, I'll show that, some that data later. Question. Yeah, so at every integer, you know, one, two, three, and some people argue, we, once the devices become good, we'll start seeing them at fractional filling factors too, we'll see. Now, we see in this system a linear resistivity, in temp, you know, resistivity linear in temperature behavior, which is very reminiscent of the strange metal behavior and Planckian physics in, 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 in cuprates and other systems. As, you know, 
as, as you know, in this, in this phase diagram, the this biggest wedge is this strange metal, and it's one of the least understood phases of this phase diagram, OK? And it's, this strange metal phase is characterized by strange behavior, hence the name. We don't understand it, so we use the word strange. And one of the typical things is you know, resistant linear in temperature when you expect actually quadratic at low temperatures. So if you take graphene and you measure the resistance versus temperature, once you get out of the superconducting state, it's linear to very high temperatures. Remember, these temperatures are of the order of the Fermi temperature. Yeah? It's the equivalent of 7,000 Kelvin for the cuprets. This device had a pretty high TC. If you take a device with a very small TC, you can see that this linear behavior you know, continues down to almost zero temperature, down to pretty much the moment at which the system becomes superconducting. Okay? By now, some groups have shown that this linear behavior goes down to 100 millikelvin at least. Okay? So this is behavior which is very interesting. We, you know, we posted this. There are some other possible interpretations in terms of phonons, but as theorists are calculating, it seems more and more unlikely. It's a problem similar to what happens in the Cooper. You thought, like, oh, maybe you could explain this, but then it goes to lower and lower temperature and phonons start to get out of the picture. So we'll see what happens. The system also exhibits various anisotropies, for example, in the, critical magnet, in the critical parallel magnetic field or in the critical current versus parallel magnetic field, which are indications of nematicity in the superconducting state. Okay? So nematicity is, you know, this, the system chooses a direction. Okay? Electron, some other parameter in the system chooses a direction. That tells you this thing, the system is pneumatic. Okay? If you take a device, this is a pretty high TC device, 3 Kelvin, 50% of state resistance. And if you now measure what is the resistance versus in-plane magnetic field direction, magnitude and direction, okay, angle, you see these two lobes. Okay? These two lobes correspond to ellipse. Let me show you the actual ellipse. Okay? This is resistance versus Bx and By. There's an ellipse. And as usual, we can do this as a function of density, et cetera. So I don't want to go through the details, but I'm happy to show you, you know, this is a whole other talk. You know, we're writing up these results. But essentially, the fact that you see an ellipse in your critical current, okay, or your critical parallel magnetic field, tells you that the system is choosing a direction. And interestingly, this direction can be changed by gate voltage in our system. Okay? So it is most likely of electronic origin, because the fact that it changes with density. Okay? And, and I'm happy to talk more about that if, if, if you have interest. Now, another thing that has a very interesting development that has happened recently is that people have seen ferromagnetism, anomalous Hall effect, and even quantum anomalous Hall effect physics. So topology is coming into the system too. Okay? And in fact, I would say that this, this field of correlated more heterostructures structures is a very nice merging of communities, you know, modern conventional communities, which were, did not interact that strongly before. Okay? One is the you know, graphene and 2D materials community. The other one is the strongly correlated communities, cuprates and other materials, nictites, et cetera. And also the topological condensed matter physics community. Okay. And they're all coming together to work in the system. So this, this, you know, this effects were predicted, again, my, my theory colleagues are very friendly and they include in their papers, but it's mostly their work. So we had already predicted that in different types of Van der Waals heterostructures, more super lattices, you can have interesting you know, topological effects, in particular finite chain numbers with different value or you know, the churn number for depending on which system you're considering. Okay? And then a few months later, the group of uh, David Wolhaber Gordon at Stanford reported this very interesting data. This is you know, RxX and RxY okay, versus magnetic field, and you see this hysteresis loop. So this system, which is pure carbon, is loaded with electrons. Okay? In this case, it's for filling around three electrons per molar unit cell. Okay? You have a magnet out of the blue. No copper, no cobalt, no, no iron, no nothing. Just pure carbon, and you get a magnet. Okay? It turns out that to have this magnetic behavior is critical. You know, what, what, what was different in these devices, which was a, you know, a, a very nice accident to have, is that one of the two graphene sheets, so we have graphene on top of graphene rotated by the magic angle, and one of the two graphene sheets is aligned with the hexagonal boron nitride. That alignment with the hexagonal boron nitride Okay. breaks the AB sublattice symmetry of the bottom layer and leads to a rupture of the C2T symmetry in the twisted valley graphene. And it was predicted this would lead to anomalous Hall effect. In fact, it was predicted that it would lead to quantum anomalous Hall effect. And about six months later, the group of Andrea Young at UCSB reported these values. This is pretty much perfect you know, 
quantization precision down to a percent or so, quantize anomalous hole effect in the system. At quantization survives up to four Kelvin, which is much larger than in the bismuth selenide alloys where the quantum anomalous hole effect has been reported or other systems. So this is you know, very interesting developments, a lot of theory work. And, and again, it's, 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 it shows that this system is very rich. You know, by now we can realize you know, almost all phases of condensed matter in this magic and graphene with or without alignment to the HBN. We don't have just you know, graphene on graphene aligned to HBN. Now we have several other systems that also display this physics, also other more correlated heterostructures. For example, you know, the second one that showed interesting behavior, well, there was the ABC, which I told you, on bilayer graphene. So the third one, I should say, was twisted bilayer by layer graphene. So this means we take Bernal stack bilayer graphene, two layers, but zero angle between them. We take Bernal stack bilayer graphene, okay? so four layers total, two and two. Now we put them on top of each other, rotated by the magic angle. Okay? That happens to be also a system which has interesting correlations. Okay? Bernal stack bilayer graphene, if you apply an electric field in the transverse direction, you break the symmetry between the bottom and the top layer, and you open a band gap. If you have these four layers, you, in this Moore system, you have a set of flattish bands. But when you apply an electric field, they become very flat, the bands. You put your Fermi level there, and you get correlated insulated states. For the experts, you know, I know I'm going quickly through this. Please ask me questions if you want. But just for the experts, so this is a back gate and top gate diagram. This is charge neutrality. This is the super lattice insulated state for four electrons and four holes per mole unit cell. This is two electrons, two holes per mole unit cell. At a finite electric field, at two electrons per mole unit cell, okay, you have this correlated insulated state with very different magnetic properties than the monolayer monolayer. This one actually happens to be ferromagnetic rather than, uh, I should say, spin polarized rather than spin unpolarized. So. The last, in the last couple of minutes, what I want to mention is that very interesting, a series of very interesting local probe studies uh, have appeared. We finally are starting to look in detail microscopically at what's going on. Okay? Before it was all transport experiments. So a few, you know, a few weeks ago, these three papers appeared in Nature, STM papers by the Pasupathy group here at, uh, at, well, there at Columbia, by the Ivan Andre group and the Ali Jazdani group, and a fourth paper in Nature Physics, which to fit it, to tilt it, let me, let me give it proper credit, put it horizontal. These four groups made, you know, look at devices where, you know, which were close or at, you know, within the magic angle range, at least some of the devices. And they all three reported, you know, 50% of the results are very similar. And what we expect, the other 50% they vary between them. Okay, but uh, overall, a pretty consistent picture. In particular, this group showed something very interesting. In when you do a STM, you can do something that you cannot do in transport. You can tune your Fermi energy, but you can interrogate at high energies, you know, away from the Fermi energy, your system by tunneling at high energy. So, in this plot, you know, this back gate and this is energy voltage on the bias tip. So they saw that the, the, these two peaks correspond to the two von Hoff singularities that are present in the flat band. So what they saw is that these two peaks are very close together when your Fermi level is not in the flat band. So if your Fermi level is in the remote band and you do a spectroscopy of the flat band, but the unoccupied flat band, two, the bandwidth is very small. But when you put your Fermi level in the flat band, your band, mm -hmm. your bandwidth increases dramatically. Okay. So it seems like this is a system where the bandwidth, when the flat band is occupied, is set by the interactions themselves. Okay? And we're beginning to have more and more evidence of this through not only these STM papers, but also our own compressibility measurements with Ray Ashuri and a number of other measurements. The other thing that um, people also reported is nematicity of the normal state. Before I mentioned nematicity, but it was of the superconducting state. And it's different, the matrices the normal state, superconducting state has different implications. But people, you know, in particular these two groups, reported the maticity of the normal state with very interesting types of anisotropic behavior, yeah, which has. Now, these were STM studies with a group of Eli Seldov with a scanning nanosquid. So we had a superconducting quantum interference device, yeah, superconducting ring with two Jason junctions on the tip 
of a, you know, on a scanning tip, so very small, and we can go and locally measure what is the twist angle over large areas. It's very hard to do for STM over large areas. Also, we can do this in an encapsulated device. STM has to have the device open, which leads to more disorder. So in, with, with the scanning nanosquid, we could in, you know, look at one of these magic angle devices. And let me show you first the transport. So this is a state-of-the-art device you know, from the point of view of transport. This is resistance versus you know, magnetic field. You see the superconducting dome there, which is the largest for two holes per more unit cell plus, you know, plus extra doping. Okay? You see there is a correlated semi-metal state at one, an insulated state at two, and an insulated state at three. So this is state of the art from the point of view of transport. You see here also happens at three, because in a magnetic field, the, the states at one and three become more visible, typically, especially the ones at three in the magnetic field. So this is state of the art in transport. And now we can look in the exact same device under the same conditions. This was taken in the nanosquid setup, we can look at the lambda levels. We can apply a little bit of a magnetic field, you know, just one Tesla, okay? And we have, you see what you know, level of exquisite detail we have to measure the lambda level and do lambda level spectroscopy in this system. This is showing, you know, a lot too much to describe, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it. In particular, it's telling us that these lambda funds have four-fold degenerate lambda levels. This one has two-fold degeneracy. This one has one-fold degeneracy. All of this was previously seen in transport, but now it's seen 10 times better with this spectroscopy. This is telling you about the degeneracy of the system, which is very interesting. And the thing is that we can do this mapping. The position of these lambda levels is extremely sensitive to the twist angle. So we can now measure this as a function of position. You have small variations. We can measure variations of 0 0.001 degree in twist angle, this technique. And we can do maps. We can measure maps of the local twist angle in our devices. So in, for this paper, we measured two devices. One device that shows superconductivity and some insulative behavior, but you could see from transport it was not super high quality. And that had a broad distribution of local twist angle. The one that shows this very high quality data Okay, that's one where in between, it's this one, in between the contacts, okay, here there's a bit more, but in between the contacts, which is the region that we measure, is this narrow peak. It has about a 0 0.01, 0 0.02 degrees to standard variation in that region. Okay? But now we have a lot of access to, to many of these things. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is not just graphene on graphene, you know, we have all of the behaviors that you want in condensed matter physics, we have them now in 2D materials, metals, semi-metals, topological insulators such, such as WT2, insulators, semiconductors, superconductors that are themselves, you know, 2D and they have an isolated in monolayer form, all of these have an isolated in monolayer form, and even magnets, quantum spin liquids, etc. So we can put now everything on top of itself and Either it will be a magic angle for a flat mat condition, or in many cases, it's enough to just have a small angle of rotation to introduce correlations. If the correlations were not present, we'll introduce them. If they were present, we will modify them, okay? So this is something which is, you know, highly tunable, and again, brings together all of these communities, and I think it's, it's fascinating. So let me end with the acknowledgments. You know, this is work uh, done by, by you know, my group members and my collaborators, and. You know, Yuan Cao in particular is a graduate student which was involved with the discovery and did a lot of the work and continues to do a lot of the work. New generation of students are working on this, and we have enjoyed a lot of you know, collaboration with our theorist friends, Centel's group, Lian Food, also experimental with Rhea Shuri, Tim Kak Sirius, our Japanese. This is me with my group members and showing off my paella cooking skills. And I want to thank you for your attention.